Our next guest, former starting quarterback of the Detroit Lions of the 1980s, Eric Hippel. Eric, good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Good morning to yourself. So good to have you here. And I just think about how different the league is today than it was when you played, how different the passing game is. Back then in the 80s, there was a bit of an offensive evolution, but most of it still was establish the run, run the football, play defense, right? Yeah, and uh, most of it still had a tight end involved. You know, it was in tight two-back offenses. And uh, and the biggest thing was the rule changes are different. I mean, you could hit a quarterback back then. You could take him down. You could hit him after you get released the ball. Um, they couldn't throw the ball away. So a lot less duress on a quarterback today. However, the, uh, the mental pressure as far as you're throwing the ball almost every play. And so uh, reading defenses and, and coming away that way. But, but um, as I said, it used to be, you know, uh, if you threw the ball, uh, three things could happen. One of them was only one of them was good. Today, two of them are good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, change the odds a little bit. So almost so all of them are good at this point in time, <laughs> yeah, right? Because yeah. you can draw a pass interference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody can hit you. Not even hit you. Yeah. Get a roughing the passer call, like uh-huh. Tom Brady got last week. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. a million things that are good now about passing the football, and you can throw it away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, how how worried were you when you were going back to pass? That, as you said, none of the rules were helping you back then. I mean. How concerning is that when you go back to pass going, oh, my God, if I don't have the right read here, I'm dead. Well, yeah, that was the biggest thing was the pressure was I have to throw the ball because either that or take a sack. I have to throw the ball. And so if, if your guys are covered and the pressure's coming in, you got to find a place to throw it downfield. Otherwise, it's a it's a you know, intentional grounding. So you got to play you got to throw it downfield. And so a lot more interceptions and and uh, and a lot of more duress on a quarterback from going from the point of getting the ball to the two and a half seconds that you got to throw the ball. He said, you got to throw it, man. Yeah. <sighs> And playing in the old NFC Central with the old Bears of the 80s, I mean, what type of overwhelming moment is that to see the 46 defense coming after you? Well, the, you know, the Super Bowl year that they, uh, they won the Super Bowl with that defense, it was the, I, I, in my mind, it was the defense that actually changed the game. Because what it forced you, we finally had to find a, you know, over the years, find a way to break it, which was just spread everybody out. And so we'd shift the tight end way out. We'd take the hat, you know the halfback and put him way out. So you ended up in a spread offense. So you could see it. And then once you started seeing it, then it started catching on. Then that's a, you know the spread offense start coming in and spreading everything out and spread the defenses so you could see what's going on. And I think that they actually forced that. I think they were part of the game of, our, uh, of uh, making offensives spread their offensive out and turn it into you know uh, an easier read. Eric Hipple joins us, former starting quarterback of the Detroit Lions of the 1980s. I think about this question in NFL history a lot. Why the 85 Bears were the 85 Bears, but the 86 Bears, the 87 Bears, the 88 Bears could never replicate that. And is it is it because of that schematic change that offenses finally figured out after 85 how to counteract all the all the pressure? I, I believe so because what happened was uh, you started seeing Miami started running that defense, the New York Jets started running that defense, um, other teams had a package with that defense. That means um, in practice you got a chance to practice against it. Before that, you know, other teams that never played the Bears all of a sudden come up against them. They didn't know what, you know, how to prepare for it or even how to play against it. But once you got used to playing against it and spreading things out, then you could see it. And I think that was the evolution. It was changed all of a sudden. It really hit for them to come back to that defense. Unfortunately for you, there is that highlight that lasts forever <laughs> in NFL history of you getting absolutely walloped from behind by the, the 85 Bears. Does that hurt to still watch? It, you know, that was the one that really, really hurt. You know, I've been, you know, I, there are things on the clip out there where I get my helmet popped off and stuff like that, but that one hurt. <laughs> I mean, when they came at you, they had a dead run. You know, if they got somebody free, which they got free a lot, um, and linebackers back then could just put their head down and just, <laughs> yeah. like a missile, at yeah. full speed, dipping their head down. And, uh, yeah, so that was that was a tough one. Out of the Bears defensive players that, that you had to face, I mean, there's Richard Dent, there's Dan Hampton, there's Steve McMichael, there's Wilbur Marshall, there's Otis Wilson, there's Singletary. Out of those guys, which is the one guy who said, I do not want him breaking free through the line? Wilbur Marshall, <laughs> by far. Yeah. Because he would line up on the outside end. And if you didn't pick him up, he's coming free and he's running a dead sprint. I, and to me, that was it. But um, usually the linemen like H- uh, Hampton or, or, uh, or Dent, when they came through, they maul you. You know, it's not like a, a guy running full speed and dropping his head into yeah. you. You know, so they're, they're more of a mauling thing. But you really what made that defense, to me, which was fun to play that defense, was Gary Fincic back there at, at safety just ran that whole thing. And uh, 
he was smart. I mean, he was checking in and checking out plays. I mean, just like a quarterback would. And so you're trying to play this chess game with them, you know, trying to figure them out. And so that, that's what made the game fun. What made it unfun is when they came free. <laughs> <laughs> You hold a very special place in pop culture. I was just watching Mr. Mom a couple of months ago. My wife had never seen it. I said, you got to watch this movie. And there is a picture in the kid's bedroom of Eric Hipple. Yeah, the movie took place in Detroit. Yeah. And, uh, and when he was trying to take the blankie away from his, from his, from his son yes. in the background, because it's the boy's room, is there my picture? There's a Sports Illustrated picture, I think it was. Uh, Eric Hipple dropping back the pass. It was <laughs> amazing. I, I actually saw it for the first time, actually, at the movie. Oh, really? You <laughs> yeah, went go, to the movie? That's my poster. <laughs> <laughs> so, Michael yeah. Keaton stars in that is just one of the best 80s yeah. movies. Yeah. And I think about those years with you guys in Detroit. You had the ability to hand off to a very special running back. Barry Sanders overshadowed, I think, everybody in Lions history because of what he did. But Billy Sims was so special. And playing with Billy, I mean, that must have been amazing. Two great running backs. I, I got a chance to, to be uh, uh, on the same team with Barry Sanders, you know, my last year. But um, watching Billy Sims and Barry Sanders, two different backs completely, um, but both are so effective in what they did. Billy was a workhorse, man. You get the guy, you know, the ball 35 times a game, and he's always positive yards. You know, he's never negative yards, always positive yards. Slasher, had, could jump, could leap, so he could get the short down, the short yard down with you. Barry, complete opposite. Barry is probably an offensive coordinator's nightmare because you can't call plays for him because it's like, okay, yeah. we got four yards on this play. Yeah. Well, you lost 10 on that one, and you just got 40 yards on that one, and then we lost 10 again. I mean, so it was like all over the place, but a one-on-one, -on -one, nobody, nobody could touch Barry. Nobody. When you watch Barry from behind and you're handing the football off or you're just behind the offensive line, are you wowed because he's seeing things that just nobody else could see and nobody else could really predict? The, the, the coolest thing was, you know, when you hand off, you know, sometimes you carry out a fake to make it look like a pass so you kind of set something up. You hand it off to him, you just had to stop and watch. It was the best seat in the house, man. You yeah. stand by him and watch him. Yeah, and not because what you get a chance to do is you get a chance to see the defensive guy's face. And just, just this look of, like, <laughs> shock or Where'd their jaw go? would drop. Their eyes yeah. were, like, you know, size of, you know, half dollars. It was just like, man. It was, like, it was, it was amazing. Yeah. Fun to watch. Former Lions quarterback Eric Kippel is our guest here on Radio Row in Atlanta. You never played outdoors, right? You were not at the Tiger Stadium days of the Lions. No, no, no. We were at Silverdome. Already yeah, the yeah, Silverdome. Yeah, yeah. Must have been nice. Yeah, well, it, it was. But you know what? I like playing outdoors. You did? Yeah, I like playing outdoors. I, to me... Uh, when we go play Green Bay, great place to play. You know, the field's always heated. I don't care if it's cold. It's still a great place to play just because of the tradition. It's outdoors. I love going down to, like, Tampa, for example, because the ball's sticky and tacky. You know, and I like grass. You know, so that's yeah. how I was. You know, everything. The, well, actually, the fields today are like grass, even though they're not. You know, yeah. They weren't the hard synthetic turf that we played on. But the, um, I, liked, I liked outdoor. But Silverdome could get rocking. That's one thing it was. It was 80,000 people, 85,000 people that were just loud and right on top of you. Pretty cool. So you have devoted your life to trying to remove the stigma of depression and suicide awareness. This is something that affected your family very closely. You have a book, Real Men Do Cry, which chronicled your life as an NFL quarterback from when you were very young to where you are right now. How significant is speaking out about depression and suicide because of the history within your family? It's, it's, really, um, it's really shaped everything that I've done in the last 15 years. The, uh, you know, I lost my son. He was 15 years old. Uh, lost him to suicide. Um, then I just took it, you know, uh, crash and burn and uh, ended up just spiraling out of control. Um, I got my life back a little bit, and then I ended up working for the University of Michigan Depression Center for 11 years um, and started learning everything I could about the brain and doing outreach, and we started doing... Uh, work with uh, for NFL players, you know, doing evaluations. Um, I moved into the military side, doing suicide prevention for the military, and then uh, what came out of that was uh, where we are today with doing work with After the Impact Fund, which was designed to treat both um, uh, uh, raise funds for treatment for both veterans and also former players. And uh, and now we're at the Transformation Center um, uh, treatment facility. It's down in Florida, Delray Beach. And so we have a program there that we actually do both. So we'll treat both uh, veterans and also former players as well in the addiction area, but also um, in the mental health area. Transitions are so difficult for players when they leave the game. And it's the same thing with military. Wearing a uniform you're, you're, you know, since you were nine years old or wearing a uniform for 15 years of your service, and all of a sudden you're out of it. And uh, what do you do next? And so that loss of identity is really, is really huge. And so um, putting these things together and trying to do outreach and, and, and so we can 
get guys to, you know, if nothing else, just awareness of what you're going through. And then ultimately, if they need a treatment with them and their families. I'm sure we have a lot of listeners that have dealt with tragedy in their family, perhaps suicide as well. When you lost your son at 15 years old, what was the arc of your emotions? How, how difficult did it get for you? Well, it went from uh, just an empty screen that happened when I got the phone call um, to just pure numbness when I was in the, at, the, you know, at the morgue looking at his body. Um, and then um, from there, it was just a race of, uh, and of just trying to stay sane, but really um, taking anything I could just to be numb. I, I, I didn't want to live. I mean, uh, but you have to, because now you know what it's like not to for everybody else, because it re creates a lot of pain. And uh, it was just a struggle trying to function and be numb and uh, for several years like that until you know, finally, finally came to an end and I had to do something. And, um, and so I reached up and with the support of family and friends and everything else as opposed to going the other way, going down. And that was the change. What was the moment that awakened you that you said, okay, I can't, I can't be down now, I have to reach up? What happened? <laughs> well, I was sitting in jail. <laughs> I, had a, I got picked up on a DUI and I uh, actually did uh, two months in jail. And it was like at the end of that thing, um, I'm looking at everybody and everybody had an excuse. Everybody, you know, the reason why they're there. And I thought, man, um, I can either have that same excuse or I can make a decision to do something about it. And I chose to do something about it. And so that was the, the step, the first step of education, looking at it, um, uh, speaking out about it and, uh, and recovery in my own self. And, uh, and that, was, that was the step. You know, you read about this and hear about this all the time. How difficult is the what could I have done to change it? I mean, that must be all-consuming after it happens. It is. First of all, you've a tremendous amount of guilt. Like, how did I miss it? But not only that, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's my son. You know, I should be, you know, taking care of him, be, you know, protective of him. So there's a tremendous amount of guilt to get through. And you can't really grieve until you get through that part of it. And then the grieving part is actually trying to learn to grieve and then, and then forget it. But the, what I could have done now, you know, is the recognition and getting him to help. That's the biggest thing, you know. Um, and I think that's where people a lot of miss because they don't know what to do or what to get educated. You know, go on uh, websites, look at, you know, signs and symptoms of what things look like and just uh, be aware and have an open dialogue. You know, you can, you can tell me anything. So for our listeners where... Might be post-military, might be post-playing, might be a family member that you're dealing with or that you've dealt with. Where can they get information about trying to, to latch on to all this great support and help that you're talking about? You can go on uh, aftertheimpactfund.org. That's aftertheimpactfund.org. Or you can go on uh, transformationstreatment.center. Transformationscenter. Excuse me, transformations, transformationstreatment.center. Uh, are two great uh, uh, sites to go to. After the Impact Fund, A-T-I-F. You can quickly Google that. That's pretty, pretty easy. And also you can join Eric and the rest of the guys that are part of this After the Impact Fund at a Super Bowl party. Ditka and Jaws Cigar with the Stars coming up on Thursday night of this week. So if you're going to be in the area, you can check out that as well. But again, if you're not going to be there, aftertheimpactfund.org is a place you can get more information. Eric, I really appreciate you stopping by, man. Thanks so much. Hey, really appreciate the interview. Thank you very much. Great you got job. it. Thank Eric Hippel, former starting quarterback for the Detroit Lions, joining us this morning here on the DA Show.